good evening warm welcome to the interactive session on india australia economic cooperation and trade agreement organized by fiki jointly by along with the jdgft kochi in association with the australia india business council and australian council general office south india and chennai we are also grateful to supporting partners to the program mrs tsx soft and mrs act migration services as you are aware india australia signed a landmark bilateral trade agreement that has come into effect from 29 december 2022 and uh, we are going to detail about the various aspects of this agreement which will be highly beneficial to the trade industry at large especially from the kerala we have our dignitaries i would request uh, presiding officer of the program mr venu rajamani former ambassador of india to netherlands and officer on social duty external affairs government of kerala to be occupied I request His Excellency Sarah Kuli, Australian Council for South India, please be on the dais. Ms. Jodi Mackay, National Chair, Australia India Business Council, former Cabinet Minister, Leader of Opposition, NSW. Mr. Alex Nainan, President, uh, Chairman, Fiki Kerala Task Force on Exports, and also the President of the Seafood Export Association of India Kerala Chapter. Mr. Bimin Menon, Development Commission, Noida says the Department of Commerce, Government of India, Additional Director of Foreign Trade. Mr. Harilal, John Director of Foreign Trade, Kochi. Mr. Rufan Malik, National Associate Chair and President, New South Wales, ABC Chapter. I also welcome our industry speakers, Harish Kalkatawala and Jimmy J Jacob, CEO of uh, Founder June IT Solutions and Sun Sulel Mathai, Director of ACT Migrant Service. They will be joining towards the second part of the program. So with this opening note, we are beginning this program. The program is also going on live on the Fiki web portal as well as the uh, YouTube channels also. I now request uh, Sri Alex Lain and Chair of Fiki Kerala State Council and Tax Force Chairman of the Export Committee to formally deliver the welcome address. Respected dignitaries on the dais, Her Excellency Leo, Australian Council General for South India, Sri Venu Rajamani, former Ambassador of India into Netherlands, uh, and now Officer on Special Duty External Cooperation, Ms. Judy McKay, National Chair. Australia India Business uh, Council for Council and former Cabinet Minister and Leader of Opposition of uh, New South Wales as well. Mr. Irfan Malik, National Associate Chair and President New South Wales uh, AABC Chapter. Mr. Bibin Men, Development Commissioner, Noida Special Economic Zone, Department of Commerce, Government of India, and Additional Director, General of Foreign Trade. Mr. Hadilal, Joint Director General of Foreign Trade, Kochi. Mr. Sabio Matthew, Head, Fiki, uh, uh, Fiki Kerala State Council. Industry speakers, uh, Mr. Uh, Harish Kalkarawala, CEO and co-founder of uh, Presix. Mr. Jimmy Jacob, CEO and founder, June IT Solutions Private Limited. Mr. Sulal Matai, Director, ACET Migration Services. Officials from the Central Government, State Government, Australian Consulate in Chennai. Members of FIKI, invitees from the trade and industry and the media. Good evening and a very warm welcome to the interactive session on uh, India Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement IAECTA, Enhancing Trade and Economic uh, Trade and Business by FIKI and JDGFT Kochi in association with Australia India Business, uh, Business Council and Australian Council General uh, Office South India. We are grateful to the uh, supporting partners to the event, Mrs. Uh, Tracy Software Private Limited, Mrs. Uh, June IT Solutions Private Limited, and Mrs. ACET Migration Services. As you are aware, India and Australia signed the landmark bilateral trade pact, uh, economic cooperation and trade 
Agreement IAECTA on 2nd April 2022, which came into effect from 29th December 2022. The agreement is expected to increase uh, trade between the two countries to 45 to 50, 45 to 50 billion over a period of five years for, from the current estimate of 27 billion and create over 1 million additional jobs. It is learned that the agreement will ensure in uninterrupted supply of key raw materials from Australia to the Indian industries, whereby Australian exporters will get a more access to markets and Indian exporters will get access to the Australian markets on various products. The agreement will be highly beneficial for the sectors such as uh, gems and jewelry, textiles, leather, footwear, furniture, food and agriculture products, engineering products, medical and pharmaceuticals, automobiles, etc. On the other hand, India will be offering preferential access to Australia on over 70% of its tariff lines, including lines of export interest in Australia. Under the agreement, Indian, Indian graduates from STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, will be granted extended post-study work visas from two to three years uh, in Australia. Australia will also set up a program to grant visas to young Indians uh, working, uh, looking to pursue working holidays in Australia. We will have a more detailed uh, analysis in, uh, of my, on uh, IAECTA and the scope for further economic and cooperation between the two countries, which will be elaborated later in the session. Before taking up the main task assigned to me and welcome the key dignitaries of the session, I would like to briefly uh, touch upon FIKI. The Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, or FIKI, the apex body of uh, chambers of commerce and industry in the country, was established in 1927. FIKI, headquartered in the national capital, New Delhi, has presence in 18 states in India and major international destinations across the world. FIKI has made enormous efforts to remain relevant with changing dynamics in business. FIKI operates in uh, 70 plus uh, different industries, industry verticals from A to Z categories spanning various se sectors of the economy. FIKI has expert committees with task force for, uh, for over 40 plus academic sectors as uh, reports, knowledge papers and survey and conducts exhibitions, B2Bs, etc. India has an exclusive economic zone of 2.02 million square kilometers and a long coastline of 8,118 kilometer with rich and diverse marine living resources. The governing blue growth uh, initiative. As the backbone of India's economic growth, India with its vast expertise on marine resources can play a key role in the development of the blue economy of India. FIKI spearhead several initiatives in key areas in alignment with the Indian, uh, Indian foreign policy objectives such as G20 and blue economy. FIKI has also brought out a knowledge paper on uh, blue economy titled Blue Economy Vision 2025, Harnessing Business Potential for India Incorporated and international partners. Piki's National Startup Committee aims to build a, a booming startup ecosystem in the country and uh, foster economic growth by leveraging innovation to attain a competitive edge in the Indian Ocean, in the, in the Indian Ocean regions. Piki had organized a startup delegation to Sydney in uh, September 2018. FIKI also organizes uh, exclusive interactions of Indian industry with the High Commissioner of uh, Australia in India on a regular basis. FIKI also coordinates outgoing delegations to Oceania countries. FIKI also has a very active uh, office in Melbourne, coordinating all initiatives between India and Australia. All our distinguished speakers will uh, be elaborately introduced uh, later, just prior to this speech. Now, let me extend a warm welcome to His Her Excellency, Ms. Sarah uh, Kilyu, Australian Council General for South India. Ms. 
May I also welcome, very warmly welcome Mr. Venu Rajamani, former Ambassador to, of India to Netherlands, now Officer on Special Duty, External Cooperation, Government of India. Welcome, sir. A very warm welcome to Ms. Jodi McKay, National Chair, Australia India Business Council and former Cabinet Minister, Leader of Opposition, of New South Wales. Mr. Irfan Malik, National Associate Chair and President, New South Wales AIBC Chapter. Warm welcome to you as well. A warm welcome to Mr. Bibin Menon, Development Com Commission, NOIDA, Special Economic Zone, under the Department of Commerce, Government of India, and the additional Director General of Foreign Trade. Warm welcome to Mr. Harilal, Joint Director General of Foreign Trade, Gochin. I also extend a warm welcome to the industry speakers, Mr. Harish Kalkatawala, CEO and co-founder Travis Tresix. Mr. Jimmy Jacob, CEO and founder June IT Solutions Private Limited. Mr. Sulal Mathai, Director, ACAT Migration Services. Warm welcome to the officials from the supporting partners to the program as well. I also warmly welcome the officials from the central government, the state government, Australian uh, Consulate in Chennai, members of FIKI, invitees from the trade and the media as well. I hope you all have a wonderful session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex, Nainan, Chairman, Fiki Kerala State Task Force on Export Committee for the formal welcome address. I would now request Mr. K. Harlal, Joint Director General of Foreign Trade, JDFT Koshin, for the opening remarks. As you are aware, this program is jointly organized by Fiki along with the JDG of Kochi. Respected dignitaries on the diet. Uh, His Excellency Ms. Sara Kirli, Australian Consul General for South India, uh, Sri Rivenu Rajamani, former Ambassador of India, Ms. Jodi McKay, National Chair, Australia India Business Council, Mr. Irfan Malik, Mr. Alex Nainan, Sri Vipin Menon, Development Commission, Noida Assessor, Mr. Savia Matthew, dignitaries on the dais, off the dais, a warm good evening to all. Uh, <clears throat> we all know. A uh, few months back, we have conducted a similar program for India, UAE, SEPA. And uh, I am sure that ki we have uh, a lot of exporters and importers. This session along with the uh, DGFT, along with the FIO, uh, FIKI. So uh, let me tell you that ki this is the second free trade agreement or a SEPA that India had concluded with a foreign country in the last, in the uh, 2022, which was operationalized uh, from December 2022. So I have gone to the data of exports from Kerala to Australia, and I have found that ki there, are, there is around uh, 60 million US dollars of export is happening from Kerala to Australia in the year 2021-22. And out of which I found that around 30 million US dollars of uh, export was already happening with a zero duty. So there is no incremental advantage for this 50% of export. However, the rest 50%, we are getting a straight trade tariff reduction of 5%. So which are all the sectors which we are uh, getting the benefit? I'll go to a brief that... The carpets, all the carpets, mat, coir product, which are being exported from Alapi uh, and Kotem, they are getting a straight duty reduction of 5%. Then we are having uh, food products like bread, coffee, bread, cake, biscuits, pastry, etc., which we are exporting to Australia. That is also going to get a duty reduction of 5%. Essential oil, which are one of the premium uh, in from Kerala, that is uh, this pepper, ginger, oils, essential oil, etc. That, uh, that was also facing a duty of 5% till last month. And uh, that was reduced to five, uh, zero now. And uh, we already know that ki, this 50% of uh, products, that means almost 100% of the products exported from Kerala is having a zero duty in Australia from 
this month onwards. So for that, you have to get a certificate of origin from uh, various government department that is from one of the organization is DGFT. And I'm sure that key, going through the experience of India UAE, we are getting a feedback, anecdotal evidence that key, there is an increase of 30%, at least incremental increase of 30% of export uh, growth of 30% happening uh, uh, from Kerala to UAE just because of duty reduction that is India UAE SEPA which was which was uh, began in last year. So uh, if that can be projected towards India Australia then I am sure that this 60% of 60 million US dollars of export from Kerala to Australia may be jumped to a say 90 90 million or at least 100 million and uh, this uh, coming year with the uh, government of india and government of australia has provided a large number of this kind of uh, regulatory framework that is trade framework for you it is the exporters and uh, the traders and the businessman has to exploit this opportunity seeing this opportunity kerala government of kerala has organized a interactive session yesterday also in trivandrum and the honorable minister of uh, industries kerala mr rajiv also uh, participated for around 2 3 hours and we had a detailed discussion with the business partners from australia uh, the uh, mr irfan malik know very well how enthusiastic the minister was towards this agreement so having said that i am not uh, uh, wasting much of uh, your time so uh, i hope this session will enlighten the participants as well as the industry to utilize this agreement to the fullest extent to grow their business and uh, uh, thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you mr kem herlal john direct general foreign trade for the opening remarks and also briefly touching upon the various aspects of the agreement of course mr bibin menon will be later on explaining the minute in detail how you can trade can benefit out of it now request uh, Sri Gunnar Rajamani, uh, IFS, former ambassador of India, Netherlands and OST and external operations, external cooperation government of Kerala to give the presidential address. Before that, you must be all aware of uh, Gunnar Rajamani's uh, just brief profile. Sir has uh, 34 years of uh, experience in international relations. And Rajamani Masar was former ambassador of India, Netherlands from 2017 to 2020. He was also permanent representative of India to the organization of provision of chemical weapons in the Hugh. Rajamani also held the office of press secretary to the Indian President Pranam Mukherjee from 2012 to 2017. He was also part of President Mukherjee's term during interaction with the various visiting leaders to various, from various countries. He also served as Joint Secretary and Head of Multinational Institution Division of the Department of Economic Affairs Ministry of Finance Government of India from 2010 to 2012. And also was a, a held, held a tenure as a Council of India Dubai from 2007 to 2010 and also held important uh, served at the Indian missions in various countries, Hong Kong, Beijing, Geneva, and Washington, D.C., and with a lot of experience in international operations. Over to you, sir, for the presidential address. Thank you, Savio, for that uh, introduction. Good evening, friends, uh, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to begin by complimenting the GDFT and FIKI outstanding initiative to come here to Cochin, to come to Kerala, to interact with business, to explain to them the advantages of this economic cooperation and trade agreement, which has been signed between India and Australia. This has been described by our Prime Minister himself as a watershed agreement. And I think there would be nobody who would disagree with that statement. It's an extremely important agreement. And it's wonderful that this initiative has been taken to bring all these people to come and meet the business community. We welcome. Uh, Her Excellency Ms. Sarah Kirliu, Australian Consul General for South India. Uh, please, Madam, 
to Kerala several times. We welcome you to come here again and again. I just had a long discussion with her on all the possible areas of collaboration that is that could happen between Australia and Kerala and how we could move forward to operationalize that. Ms. Jodi McKay, National Chair, former cabinet minister, leader of opposition in New South Wales. A special welcome to you, madam. I was delighted to hear that you came on the 24th and you have been traveling around Kerala. Please take the message back to Australia and send your friends, send your relatives. Yeah, we would, we would love to have uh, more and more of uh, Australians here, uh, especially in Kerala, where we are proud of our national beauty. Uh, the tourism tagline, as all of you know, is God's own country, and we would like to keep it uh, that way. To both of you, as well as our colleagues from the DGFT, uh, the JDFT, who is based here, the, Mr. Bibin Menon from NOIDA. I live in NOIDA. And Rifan Malik, who is a key organizer, thank you so much for putting all this together. And of course, our colleagues from uh, FIKI, I was particularly happy that Alex Nainan is from the seafood industry. Friends, I said this is an outstanding initiative and we truly need initiatives like that because often governments sign agreements. I think diplomats like us know uh, any number of agreements are signed, but very few of them actually become a reality. And this is an agreement with a very big difference. It, it has already become a reality on the 29th. I think the first shipment from Mumbai was flagged off by the Commerce Minister. And as the agreement starts rolling, it contains huge for each one of you to benefit from it, the business community. And it is not only substance. I think an initiative like this truly pushes what has been agreed between governments towards actual uh, facts and trade and business on the ground. Mr. Harlal explained to you the trade which happens from Kerala. He said 30, billion, 30 million is already zero duty. So it isn't the uh, FTA is not the agreement. The new agreement is not going to make a difference. But much and the for the others, you'll get a 5% duty reduction. What is important to for each one of you to keep in mind is that the duty reduction is only one element of any business agreement. And that is where the presence of the India-Australia Business Council and the B2B meetings that they have been having is extremely important. If trade has to happen, if business have to happen, and if we have to achieve the kind of ambitions we have, I think $50 billion in the next five years nationally, uh, we need to go much beyond what we are already exporting and those in the fields where exports are taking place have to expand their business contacts in a massive manner within Australia. So this agreement, however good, substantive, and bringing of benefits it may be, this 5% duty, that by itself is not enough. You, all of you in this room, have to establish contacts with Australian business counterparts. And in the discussions through them, you have to make this trade happen, and that is the most critical thing. And all studies of trade at FTAs show that the duty component is only one factor in making trade happen. Ultimately, you have to be price competitive. Ultimately, you have to be quality conscious. Whatever goes from here, if you are looking at exports towards Australia, has to meet the stringent quality criteria that Australia, as well as most countries in the world, have. And you must be nimble on your toes in establishing business connections and contacts in Australia to make more and more of the trade happen. Friends, Australia, let me just say a few words, is one of the, mo the most important countries for India today. While talking about this agreement, once again, the Prime Minister said this agreement is going to contribute in a major way towards stability to, in the India-Pacific. Australia and India are partners in the building of a new Indo-Pacific. We are partners in bringing peace and stability to the region. And we are partners in promoting economic whole. Once upon a time in Indian foreign policy, in our uh, relationships with various countries, Australia used to be one of the neglected countries. Australia...
that we established with Australia. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, this is only the beginning. Uh, as I've already mentioned, there is great potential for uh, a close relationship between Kerala and Australia. In the last uh, year and a half, uh, the Kerala government has been taking a number of initiatives, both to improve uh, the ease of doing business within the state, as well as to establish close links with foreign countries. Uh, we re recently had a Discover Japan program uh, in Trivandrum. There is a Japan Mela coming up uh, in uh, Cochin in March. Uh, the Korean embassy is planning a Korea on the move event here. France had a Campus France initiative. US is planning a big university initiative here. We had the Norwegians doing uh, uh, international seminar on energy, uh, uh, Kerala, Norway workshop on fisheries in which an action plan was adopted on fisheries. Uh, most of you, we are looking at Vietnam to see what Kerala can learn from Vietnam in agriculture and fisheries. Uh, the Consul General of the Netherlands from Bangalore will be in uh, Trivandrum uh, a week from now for a for the fourth Dutch roundtable. Uh, one of the uh, there is a great deal of cooperation happening in water management. But one of the important uh, events which will happen in the in the next few months will be the opening of a center of excellence in fruits and vegetables in Wynard with the help of Dutch expertise. So a lot of things are happening, but within this framework, we think Australia is a very special partner, a preferred partner, and we look forward to forging a close relationship with Australia in the coming days. I wish today's discussions all the best, and I hope each and every one of you benefit personally and directly from what you learn at today's seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Subhendra Shamani. I was former ambassador of India to Netherlands, OST and external cooperation, government of Kerala. So emotionally speaking for the Kerala government and also for the trade industry community to take advantage of this uh, uh, trade agreement. Now we move to the very important function that is the formal inauguration of the program. I request uh, Subhendra Shamani, sir, as well as uh, His Excellency Ms. Sarah and uh, Judy Mackey and all the officials to join for the inaugural. I would request His Excellency, Ms. Sarah, uh, Council General of Australia and Council General for South India to give the address of the Chief Guest. And also, you must be aware that uh, Ms. Sarah takes care of the entire operations of the South India from the Australian Council at point. And she also held various important portfolios for the Government of Australia in New Delhi as well as at the Australian Church. Over to Namaskaram. 
Can you hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for having me this evening. It's a real pleasure to be here in Kochi to discuss the benefits of our new FTA, our Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. Thank you. I'm Sarah Curley, Australian Consul General for South India. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the organizer of this wonderful event. It's really very pleasing to me that there's such enthusiasm for the free trade agreement that you all came together this evening. So thank you and my fellow dignitaries on the panel. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, also, thank you to you, the audience, who've taken the time from, I'm sure, busy schedules to come and learn more about this trade opportunity. Thanks for the very warm welcome to the dais, and I'd like to note with pleasure that the flowers that were presented were actually in Australia's national colours of green and gold, so that's a particularly nice touch. Uh, Ambassador Venu spoke about a relationship that used to be based in Cricket, Commonwealth and Curry. Uh, my High Commissioner in New Delhi, Mr Barry O'Farrell, has his own updated version where he talks about diaspora, democracy, defence and Doshti, so uh, perhaps we can discuss that more later on. Uh, I have a short PowerPoint presentation. Some of the slides have been covered already in the speaking uh, remarks of others, so I'll kind of flick through those quickly where we come to it. But I just wanted to set a little bit of the strategic context for the Australia-India relationship. I've been working on the relationship since 2008, 15 years or so, and honestly, there has never been a better time in Australia-India relations. Uh, our closeness is driven by a confluence of factors. First, big strate strategic drivers in the region that are bringing us together. Second, the economic complementarity between our two countries. And third, the very strong and growing people-to-people -people and diaspora links. On the diaspora, I mean, I think it's an interesting statistic that we have in Australia, a country of 25 million odd people, around a million people of Indian origin. Seven lakh of those people were born in India. So it's a very young diaspora community, still growing very fast and a huge asset for you as business people because you have in Australia a large cohort of uh, people with a background who understand doing business in both countries. On the strategic front, you will be aware of how close Australia and India are. We share values and a viewpoint on our Indo-Pacific region that that should be open, free and prosperous. And we know we need to work in partnership to achieve that, whether it's through our comprehensive strategic partnership, whether it's in minilateral groupings like the Quad, or whether it's through regional organizations. Uh, I'm pleased to say that my prime minister will visit India twice this year. He will come for a bilateral visit in March, accompanied by a large business delegation, and he'll come again in September for the G20 summit. Also, we anticipate hosting Prime Minister Modi in Australia for a Quad Leaders Summit. So that very rapid pace of higher level engagement shows just how close we are. But today we are here to celebrate ECTA, uh, meaning unity, I understand, in Hindi. Uh, ECTA was signed in April 2022 and uh, following requisite Australian parliamentary process entered into force on the 29th of December and a second tariff cut took place on the 1st of January this year. This FTA, we hope, sends a powerful signal to the communities in both countries of the strategic interests our government have in supporting and growing bilateral trade and investment. In 2021, uh, Australia India was Australia's sixth largest trading partner. Uh, I think two-way trade was about 34 billion Australian dollars. We set a goal to reach 50 million within five years, but I do believe Minister Goyal has been challenging us to reach actually 100 million in that period. For India, the FTA brings a lot of benefits, particularly in labor intensive sectors, as you've heard, where a lot of those manufactured goods will now enter Australia tariff-free if they did not already do so. But ECTA is just part of a very rich economic relationship between Australia and India. The other thing I wanted to talk about tonight was our India economic strategy. First issued in 2018, this identified 10 sectors and 10 states of particular importance between Australia and India. After five years, we reissued an action plan and update in 2022. This is backed by very substantial Australian government funding, quite separate to ECTA, which will uh, encourage and support collaboration in a range of sectors we consider most prospective. Many of these have a direct relationship to Kerala, including education, space, 
digital health. It's a very long list, green hydrogen, green steel. So I know, and Ambassador Vino and I were discussing, there's a lot of collaboration we can do around the kind of direct trading relationship, which already exists. Benefits for Indian consumers and manufacturers. So in addition to the export of Indian goods to Australia at very close to tariff-free rates now for most things, uh, we will be sending from Australia to India cheaper Australian goods. Many of these are significant inputs to your manufacturing sector, whether it's Australian coal now coming duty-free, whether it's cotton or wool, or whether it's critical minerals, which are crucial to the emerging electric vehicle and high-tech sector. We also hope that uh, you know, uh, meat and fish eating Malayalis will enjoy uh, greater consumption of Australian lamb, greater consumption of Australian lobster. And for those of you who like to indulge, uh, the price of Australian wine will also reduce under ECTA. Uh, as you've heard, under ECTA, 96.4% of Indian goods by value already now enter Australia since entry into force at zero tariff. That'll raise to 100% within five years. But we heard how the duty component is only one element of doing business. The agreement also includes some arrangements to ease doing business between the two countries. For example, exporters will be able to receive advanced rulings on tariff treatment under ECTA, and there'll be streamlined documentation for the processing of goods shipments. These benefits are additional to what Australia already provides under our WTO trade facilitation commitments. Uh, I was told earlier this week, actually, by Indian colleagues that already since ECTA inter entered into force just two weeks ago, 535 certificates of origin have been issued, which means that 535 shipments freshly taking advantage of tariff reductions have already been sent in that two-week period. Uh, one sector we haven't touched on so far is pharmaceuticals. So drugs approved in other developed jurisdictions will now get quicker approval processes in Australia. The agreement also seeks to eliminate tariffs on ph some pharmaceuticals and medical devices over the period of the agreement. Textiles, leather and footwear, I think we've already discussed. Um, there's some interesting stats though around the actual growth that's predicted. So for instance, um, textiles exports, including things like carpets, should generate fresh employment for 40,000 people under ECTA. It's not just a goods agreement. It also includes commitments on services and labor mobility. Uh, we've heard about quotas for chefs and yoga uh, teachers wanting to go to Australia and extended post-study work rights for STEM graduates in Australia. So we know that for many students looking for an Australian education, it's a very high quality education. Seven of our, uh, seven of our universities are in the global top 100. But for many families, it's also knowing that students will be able to stay on and get professional expertise to complement their degree. So we have locked in under ECTA the commitment that that will be made available and in those specific fields that are longer period than is available to other encourages young people to come to Australia to get to know our country through a mix of work and tourism. Uh, we're looking at a, a thousand places a year for Indians between aged between 18 and 30, beginning from 2024. Kerala's startup economy, I've been hearing a lot about just how vibrant that is. And the agreement also has some provisions relevant to IT companies. We have a separate double taxation avoidance agreement between Australia and India. And one of the side letters of ECTA resolved uh, an irritant that was there around the tax treatment of Indian companies. So the big, the big majors, Infosys, Tata, have all been saying how very pleased they are with that, but we know it will benefit others as well. There's also a higher threshold for the screening of incoming investment in the services sector, from 289 million to 500 million Australian dollars before it triggers uh, national security screening.
Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my presentation, but I know we're going to have more discussion later on. I'd also encourage you to access the very many resources that are available online, the website of my own department, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, which is www.dfat.gov.au, has a lot of detail, including the full text of the agreement and the full tariff quota schedules. And I'm sure the same is available on the Indian websites. You can research your specific product and find out what the treatment will be. For me, uh, coming to Kerala has always been a great pleasure. I've made half a dozen trips at least in the past few years. Uh, and I know that this vibrant economy, this wonderful society will be able to take full advantage of ECTA and the benefits it offers for Australia and India. Thank you for listening. Thank you, His Excellency, Ms. Sarah. Australian Council General for South India for the inaugural address and also briefly touching upon the various important aspects of the agreement. Now we have another important guest of honor, Ms. Judy Mackey, National Chair of Australia India Business Council, former Cabinet Minister and Leader of Opposition, New, New NSW. Ms. Judy Mackey, uh, Mackey is the National Chair of India, Australia India Business Council and the leading business chamber in Australia. As you are aware, IBC is a non-profit organization set up in 19... 86 uh, by the prime ministers of both the countries. And Ms. Judy was also responsible for various portfolios of tourism, SMEs, health, healthcare, science, medical research, commerce, women's policy, and transport, uh, planning, and multiculturalism. Ms. Judy was also vice chancellor for Lord South India, South Asia for Western Sydney University. Over, over to Ms. Judy. Uh, thank you, thank you. Thank you very, very much for that warm welcome. And can I just, um, first of all, say thank you to Fiki because uh, they brought everyone together today. And Fiki has uh, been a long and certainly um, passionate partner of the Australia India Business Council. So um, we have a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with Fiki. So when Fiki is in Australia, we support their efforts and vice versa. So it's wonderful that Fiki has been able to bring its members uh, together uh, today to hear about the free trade agreement with Australia. Um, I am uh, traveling around India, but I started my journey, as uh, Mr. Rajmani said, in Kerala. And I did that because our Malayali community in Australia was desperate for me uh, to be here to see God's own country and to know just how beautiful Kerala is. Um, you've heard tonight from both uh, Sarah and Mr. Rajamundi about how important our diaspora is. And uh, I can't tell you um, enough about how passionate our Malayali Australian community is for this free trade agreement to work. So they were keen for me to be here. It's the start of um, many visits. Uh, I know that I will be making to different Indian states. Uh, I think I'm here for a month in total. And from tomorrow, I'm in Chennai, then Delhi and Mumbai, and we've been in Hyderabad. And it's just been an extraordinary visit. And everywhere I go, uh, there is certainly enthusiasm for this agreement. Um, I first became aware of that enthusiasm for agreement when Piyush Goyal was in Australia in April when this agreement was first signed. I sat with him at a dinner with our uh, former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and uh, I was also a little sceptical about this agreement. It's a framework, really. It's a, it's a piece of paper in, in a sense. But um, what I got from uh, what he uh, said at that dinner was his enthusiasm for this to work. You've heard that this is a watershed agreement, and it is. It is the first free trade agreement that India has entered into with a developed country. Um, the UK, USA, um, Canada, they're all now rushing to get a free trade agreement with India. But until this year, India has resisted entering into a free trade arrangement with any country. Um, but we are pleased as Australia to have what's called first mover advantage. And that's why I'm in India. It's why my colleague Ifan Malik is here. It's why Sarah and her consulate have been incredibly busy because we need to make sure that in India and Australia, the details of the free trade agreement are known. Now, some of those have been given to you tonight and I'm not going to go over them, except to say, um, please familiarize yourself with the portals of both countries because uh, each country will tell you the advantages and the disadvantages. They'll tell you what has been gained and what hasn't been gained. But it's worthwhile getting a perspective from both countries. 
I started um, my presentation to you in mentioning the diaspora, but what has become uh, very obvious to me and one of the things that um, we are very active in promoting as a business council is that you need to use the diaspora in Australia. So Australia is much like India in that we have different states. Um, our states are relatively similar, but they have different governments and those governments have different priorities. So much like you would in India, please familiarize yourselves with the priorities of those states. Familiarize yourself with the contacts you may have in those states. The other thing I will say to you is that, um, and I've spoken to many of you uh, this evening as we've been working through our one-on-ones, but um, you need to do your homework before you enter into Australia. Um, it's no use just saying, I want to be in Australia. You have to actually do some work to understand who your partners could be, which state you may want to be in, and whether your product is currently available in Australia, or whether you should be, in fact, manufacturing and not just exporting into Australia. So each state government has different incentives that they offer for businesses, obviously more incentives for those who want to uh, establish in Australia. But Australia is geared up to work with India and as well as um, Sarah's uh, consulate here, uh, as well as Austrade being here, each of those states have trade commissions that are here as well. And so they're there to entice you into their particular state. So the other message I would give you is this is competitive between the states of Australia. So Victoria competes with New South Wales, who competes with Brisbane for business and trade. So keep that in mind as you're working through what the possibilities are for you in, in Australia. But as I said, the strongest thing you have in all this is the diaspora, a passionate Malayali community that actually wants this to work. I want to just um, touch, if I may, on the Kerala government. As the um, Director General said, we had a wonderful session yesterday with the industry minister, and I was messaging him last night as well. And there is a strong commitment from Kerala to make this work. Um, we heard that there's a $60 million um, bilateral trade uh, between Australia currently, about 50% uh, of that will benefit from the free trade agreement in terms of the wiping of duties. But there's huge potential here for other industries as well. And I know that some of you in this room uh, are not currently uh, thinking about uh, how you will export uh, to Australia, but I would encourage you to start to understand whether the products that you're manufacturing are currently leaving Kerala heading to Australia or whether there's a new market that you could explore. Because this free trade agreement basically establishes the framework. There are duties that are wiped, 100% of duties are wiped from the Australia side. On the India side, it's about 70%. Uh, India has protected 30% of its market, and most of that is around agricultural products. But there has been an agreement by both countries that there will be areas that will be um, accepted by India, areas that will be accepted by Australia, and areas that will be respected that won't be included in the free trade agreement. So this agreement offers enormous uh, opportunities to all of you. Um, I've mentioned the support that is there from the different governments and from Austrade, and I know that Sarah um, has spoken about the portals that are available by both India and Australia. But our job as the Australia India Business Council is to make sure that we are connecting businesses. We're not going to do the homework for you, and I've said that to a number of you tonight. You have to do the homework. You have to understand where the competition is where your market is and our role is then to connect you and we do that in consultation with Fiki. So I thank uh, Fiki again for hosting this forum. Um, Ifan and I will be here uh, for the next couple of hours just uh, very happy to engage with all of you and we're also happy to provide intelligence as well um, but our role is connecting business. The second thing um, just before I end I, that I want to say is that um, Australia uh, was the first country to acknowledge India's independence some 75 years ago. And Australia India Business Council was formed by the two prime ministers 36 years ago. So we were formed by Prime Minister Bob Hawke and Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. In that time, both governments have worked really hard to make sure that this relationship is successful. But it's not until this year that we've become not just friends, we've become best friends as countries. So the framework is there. 
And as Mr. Rajamani said, it is now up to business. It is up to all of you to make this work. It is going to require effort. This is not succeeded overnight. If you enter into Australia, you go to play the long game. But Australia is open for India. And I guess that's the message that I want to leave with all of you tonight. So thank you very much for coming along to Fiki. I very much appreciate as the national chair, uh, the work that you have done as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Judy Mackin, National Chair, Australia India Business Council and former Cabinet Minister of the Opposition uh, for the address for the guest of honor also and various important tips how to do business. Of course, Ms. Judy and uh, uh, Mr. Arufan will be here to continue the discussion after the meeting also one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. And I would like to invite a very important guest and especially from uh, Kerala's perspective, we have uh, somebody from uh, with the deep roots in Kerala taking on the business in Australia and promoting the business in the Australia and Kerala perspective. I'd like to Arufan Malik. Uh, he's a, a National Associate Chair and President of NSW. And he has also various portfolios. And he's a co-founder, director in Equity Investment Global Private Limited India, UAE, Australia, founder, CEO, Crescent Infosys Private Limited Australia, member, Australian Institute of Community Directors, director, OC Innovation Service Private Limited Australia, director, Australian Future Healthcare Innovation Private Limited Australia, and director, Startup Australia Foundation Australia, and also various other portfolios. Over to Irfan for the address. Hello, everyone. Namaskaram. Uh, I'm a Malayali as well. Uh, so I've adopted uh, Australia as the country that I live and I call now home, but I still deep rooted ties to my homeland, Kerala. So uh, very pleased to be amongst yourself uh, representing the diaspora, uh, Malayali diaspora based in uh, Australia, which is one of the best countries in the world, I would say. I mean, obviously, I used to live uh, uh, in the US, uh, UK as well. Uh, then I migrated to Australia about 22 years back uh, um, and um, yeah, have loved uh, living there with family, raising the family, uh, but also just uh, uh, growing my business and just the community as well, it's just been phenomenal. So uh, open call to all of you uh, to consider Australia as well uh, as a destination. Uh, but on an opening note, I also uh, want to uh, extend uh, uh, a warm uh, greetings uh, uh, in the indigenous uh, language, uh, one of the language, uh, uh, warami uh, is the term that I'm going to use uh, to welcome, to also recognize uh, the strong indigenous First Nation uh, uh, people uh, that we represent in Australia. And this government currently in Australia is definitely giving a strong uh, support uh, to the voice of uh, uh, indigenous and First Nations. And I, I want to recognize that most importantly, because even in Kerala, we have had uh, our own uh, indigenous uh, community as well. And uh, there are facts uh, and research as well that sometime long back uh, when the techno tectonic plates were all together, uh, there was uh, close ties uh, between Northern Territory uh, in Australia, uh, the people there and Kerala as well. So definitely I want to acknowledge uh, those roots as well, uh, apart from our diaspora roots. Um, uh, but most importantly, I'm very pleased uh, that I'm amongst yourself as a business leader, uh, really calling out uh, for Kerala to step up. And I, uh, for a definite, uh, you know, uh, reason, I was really, um, so to speak, agitated within my, uh, you know, my, my heart that uh, when uh, the whole India economic strategy was put forward, uh, the 10 states and 10 sectors, Kerala didn't feature that uh, extensively. But subsequent to that, when there was, further action plan outlined and there were clearly sectors uh, which really highlighted uh, the potential for Kerala to step up. And I've seen, I mean, uh, uh, though I did not spend a lot of time, but I do have strong family roots here in business uh, where a lot of potential is there in Kerala, uh, but uh, the other states have definitely, uh, you know, ramped up. And I believe this is a great partnership uh, that uh, Australia, uh, opportunity that Australia presents where Kerala can leverage that potential and deliver the outcomes. And that's uh, what AIBC, uh, Australia India Business Council, stands for. Uh, we are a leading uh, preeminent uh, business industry body, uh, uh, you know, with pan Australia presence and but also stronger ties, close ties into India through our partners, uh, 
both industry partners as well as our GAV partners as well. And our focus is to convert these potential. And in fact, we heard uh, in today's uh, uh, this, uh, talks as well, uh, there's, uh, there's the framework is set, there's a huge potential, but how do we make that potential into outcomes? And that's what we are all about. And, and as business leaders, we want to see those business outcomes. And I'm pleased to say that today, we will showcase certain outcomes as well uh, with uh, a launch uh, of uh, certain companies, which has been happening as well, which again, I want to acknowledge even since the announcement in April, uh, uh, when the ECTA agreement uh, was signed, uh, and before it came into uh, force uh, end of uh, December, there's been a significant growth. And I want to definitely acknowledge that uh, from whatever 20, 27 uh, billion uh, bilateral trade, there's been significant growth as well. So I hope uh, we will uh, not only uh, you know, meet the, uh, the, the comparative figure of uh, UAE, but significantly grow that as well. And definitely with business leaders, uh, uh, you know, uh, we want to really focus on that people-to-people uh, -to -people connect uh, you know, through these business uh, forums so that we can deliver on those business outcomes, I suppose. I just also want to acknowledge uh, uh, AIBC in partnership with FIKI and our industry bodies. We do uh, facilitate not only awareness outreach programs like this, but also uh, we do the business to business uh, matching, uh, you know, as uh, Jody mentioned, you will need to do the research, but we will then facilitate and help you match and open the doors. But again, uh, you know, we will uh, facilitate those uh, engagements as well and working closely with our GAV and industry partners, including all the trade commission, uh, trade investment bodies as well. We also facilitate delegations as well. And I know uh, we've had uh, in Australia, um, uh, and then thanks to DFAT as well, uh, where we had about nearly seven uh, uh, federal ministers, central ministers from uh, India, senior uh, pro high profile ministers visit uh, 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 Australia, and that really, uh, you know, reinforcing our partnership. But also uh, uh, this year, we are hoping that we will have more Australian leadership, more Australian delegations uh, come here. I mean, I'll be honest, I've been living and breathing in the corporate and various sectors in Australia. The Australian corporate is still not uh, that aware of the, I mean, they know that India uh, is a huge market, but how to do business and get outcomes and then build that uh, longer term uh, opportunity uh, and convert those opportunities that's still out there. And we are also working closely with the Australian corporate as well to really, uh, you know, understand the Indian market, give it a go. Uh, and similarly, vice versa, we look forward to working with businesses here so you can deliver some successes. And we, as, uh, uh, and, and as we work closely with DFAT, we are keen to have early runs on the board. So the next three to six months, we are very keen, very keen to work with Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the Austrian, all our partners to get some good runs on the board, good case study, successful outcomes uh, over the next three to six months. And that's my commitment as well, uh, that AIBC would work closely with you to have those success stories so that they become a bit of a template or um, a reference point for more uh, business uh, traction as well. So that's something which uh, is something uh, AIBC is keen to work with. Um, but also, um, I want to acknowledge the term which is being used, the complementarity between the Australian and Indian market. And I live and breathe in the startup innovation uh, ecosystem. And Kela Startup Mission has been one of the uh, pioneering uh, uh, organization and the ecosystem here, very vibrant. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know that uh, the other ecosystems uh, in the neighboring states have uh, taken a lot of laurels with the unicorns and stuff. But I'm hopeful uh, uh, this... Uh, uh, opportunity with Australia, we will be able to curate bilateral unicorns and Kerala will benefit from that as well. Uh, I believe uh, uh, Australia is a great market for uh, Indian startups and Kerala based startups uh, because it's a great Western market to validate uh, before scaling into larger uh, European or uh, uh, US markets. Uh, and similarly for Australian uh, startups, uh, India presents a great uh, growth uh, market, not only to service India, but for rest of the opportunity. I mean, there's a huge opportunity uh, in Africa growing, one of the fastest region, and where uh, Australian companies can leverage Indian partners uh, and, and definitely uh, service those markets as well. So that's something which we are keen to explore um, uh, as an extension of uh, what uh, benefits uh, from this bilateral outcomes would be. Um, I also want to call out uh, cautiously, I mean, without uh, really uh, pushing the uh, you know button on this, uh, but Australia has definitely recognized uh, the need for looking at, uh, you know, 
uh, strategic partners and diversifying supply chain options. So we all, including India, uh, has had a lot of focus on China as a sourcing partner, but as an alternative to China uh, and diversifying that sourcing option, uh, Australia is very active. And uh, some sectors like electronics, uh, uh, electrical supplies, uh, there's a huge market. And I know we've been uh, traditionally sourcing from uh, China a lot and every country for that matter, and we'll continue to do so. But having an alternative option is something I, I go and speak to companies. And I was earlier today talking to an electrical uh, manufacturer, transformer uh, manufacturer company. I was visiting a company in Newcastle called Am Control, and they want more po partners from India. And obviously, we are hoping that we will be able to facilitate. There's a major conference coming up in February in uh, Delhi. We are looking at a lot of uh, co in, uh, Australian companies come as well. Uh, the other thing which I want to touch on, and, and I know we have gone through quite a lot of the sectorial uh, details, uh, but food and agri and seafood uh, is definitely something we've seen some early runs on the board, but Kerala has got some great uh, potential uh, products, not only to service the growing diaspora market, but also the non-diaspora market, which is really uh, warming to uh, Indian uh, fruit produce as well. Uh, healthcare, medtech and pharma, and including Ayurveda, the complementary medicine uh, space is growing, but as Jody mentioned, it's not just about exporting, because there are uh, very high quality expectations. And TGA has been very uh, stringent. And I know even some of the uh, Kerala-based companies have been impacted uh, in terms of uh, the quality uh, expectations. So how do we, uh, so it's not uh, going around that, how do we make it work uh, with TGA conformance and getting uh, it right, uh, which is something which we would love to see more companies and get those successes so that that can be, uh, you know, be a reference point and case study. Digital IT services is huge, and I, I, I feel that uh, Kerala has got a huge potential, great infrastructure. In fact, we met the IT infrastructure and the whole uh, leadership team yesterday, including the secretary. We were blown away by their vision and their, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the traction that they've been working on. But converting into that scale of that potential is something we are looking forward to working closely as well. Uh, tourism, hospitality, both Australia and Kerala has got a great focus and I want to see some great runs on the board and I think uh, we'll make it happen. Of course, Jody's uh, visit and also some of her social media posts have gone viral as well, including the Tari uh, uh, pictures even earlier today as well. It's gone really uh, viral uh, in uh, Australia. So hopefully we'll see more happen there. Art, culture, textile, handicrafts. We met some amazing um, traditional uh, GI product uh, manufacturers yesterday. And I believe, you know, there's a huge potential for them as well. But how do we handhold and get those outcomes is something which we'll focus on. Space and defense is another one. Space with the VSSE and ISRO. And I mean, I, I believe uh, uh, Kerala produces the best uh, space engineers. I mean, they've got a huge... Uh, 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 you know, uh, educational facility as well, but the whole VSSC ISR also presents a great opportunity uh, to leverage. And we are looking for uh, space tech collaboration. And I'm hopeful that a lot of Australian space tech companies will use, choose Kerala as the soft landing destination before scaling and uh, servicing other markets. Sunrise sectors, I want to call out renewable energy, clean tech and renewable energy. There's a huge growth and a lot of, not only a lot of Indian large players are investing in Australia, to scale, serve, to service Australia and other markets, but also vice versa. We are looking at a lot of Australian uh, uh, renewable uh, energy tech companies are looking for manufacturing supply source partners as well, including electronics and stuff that comes in there uh, in low cost solar, as well as uh, green hydrogen space. So that's something which I know India is doing a lot and uh, we would see a lot more collaboration. I think Kerala has got a huge potential uh, to offer there. Electronics and advanced manufacturing is something, again, I want to call out that there's a huge opportunity for Kerala to step up uh, and offer uh, more here. So I'll just uh, uh, wrap it on that because I've, I've uh, had a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction earlier prior to the session as well. I'm really energized by what I've experienced yesterday uh, at the round table uh, in Trivandrum, uh, along with the uh, Minister uh, Rajivji and also some of the uh, uh, delegates from here as well. We've had uh, a great interaction with industry the government leadership as well. So we, I'm really excited about the opportunity, but how do we make that potential to outcome is something we will all uh, need to work uh, together. And every one of us have a role to play and AIBC is keen to facilitate and deliver that outcome. And as I said, um, it is about uh, converting that potential to outcome. And I'm pleased that today we do have uh, some outcomes to talk about as well. Um, on that note, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, 
some of the uh, uh, partners or uh, support partners uh, for this event, uh, physics, um, and we've had June IT as well, uh, and ACID migration. Um, I want to call upon uh, um, Jimmy Jacob. Uh, uh, if you are here, June IT Solutions, uh, uh, we've, uh, again, calling out that we've uh, just launched uh, June IT Solutions uh, to uh, uh, Australia. NS as well, if you want to join uh, the team, uh, um, we've just launched uh, June IT uh, to service. They've got a great capability in terms of the IT services. I'm uh, pleased to uh, announce and advise uh, that uh, June IT solutions have been uh, registered and launched. And this is where, uh, you know, as Jody and Sarah mentioned, give it a go. You want to, uh, uh, you know, have uh, a presence there and then also uh, leverage uh, the market opportunity. So I want to uh, invite uh, uh, on that note, uh, Jimmy and Anas uh, to come uh, and receive the registration certificate. And if I may invite Jody and Sarah to uh, hand over the certificate, uh, uh, the registration certificate uh, of the company launch, uh, just to again, acknowledge uh, uh, that there is an outcome as well that we are keen to facilitate as well. Please. So they've been successfully registered and launched uh, and they are part of the IT digital industry here from Kerala. Uh, and we are keen uh, as uh, the council as well as uh, the ecosystem to support them as well. So definitely want to showcase that there is interest and we want to have more outcomes uh, happen uh, uh, in, uh, in this bilateral space as well as the opportunities are presented. Thank you all and uh, wish you all the best wishes uh, ahead to uh, have a transformational outcome uh, leveraging this opportunity. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, someone who was with us, uh, uh, Mr. Raghunath from uh, Sanjeevani, uh, who has a, a, a sports training and precision training uh, uh, facility. Uh, he visited us in Australia in August uh, with, at the Australia-India International Business Summit that we did. Uh, again, that was a recommendation from uh, government of Kerala for him to explore. And I probably didn't touch the sporting and sporting uh, academy industry is huge. India is a huge market uh, uh, of growth and Australian uh, capability can be leveraged in that space. So I'm really pleased to advise uh, uh, Raghunath and Sanjeevni uh, have, are also, uh, uh, you know, have a presence uh, in Australia and they're uh, in partnership. They've just signed uh, earlier in the week uh, an agreement uh, with the Canadian Australian company uh, Ray Sports to really facilitate that outcome as well. So I just want to acknowledge that. Okay, I'll hand over uh, to uh, my yeah, uh, Fiki uh, uh, team to take it forward. Thank you all. Thank you, friend. We have a very important speaker, Bibin Menon. Uh, he'll be explaining about the various provisions that the, I know that the, audience, the participants will be eagerly here. But prior to that, just two minutes uh, from our industry speakers, sir, I'd like to invite uh, Harish Kalkata Wallace, you and co-founder, how the IT sectors and the expect scenario can take advantage briefly. Uh, good evening, uh, good evening, all dignitaries on the dais. Uh, welcome you all. Uh, good evening, friends. So basically, I just mentioned before the start of the session, right? Uh, any bilateral trade or any import and export, how do we uh, kind of uh, make it ease of doing business? That is very important. And uh, the way, like, you know, every system works on a different platform, how do we integrate seamlessly? And that's where we come in. And uh, just to give the short background to the people here. So I used to head innovation for SAP in India and uh, work very closely with Australia and most of the Australian colleagues in Singapore. So uh, uh, we are here to kind of like, you know, tell you guys that uh, do spend time with uh, the product, what we have. Uh, there are people, there are team available from Trizix in Kochi. Uh, Prashob is based out of Kochi and we are putting a huge investment, especially in Kerala, to kind of see the market here and uh, see the potential of imports and exports from Kerala. So enjoy your evening. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Fiki. Thanks, Avio, for all the support. Thank you. Thank you, Harish. Uh, and now I would like to invite Mr. Sul Sulail Mathai, Director of ACT Migration Services. They are also well established in Australia in various uh, migration services.
So good evening to all, and um, thanks to Fiki for and you know, and we are proud to be uh, supporting uh, as a partner today. And Lelar Gwenda Namaskaram. After fun, I am also from Kerala, from Kottayam. So it's really a proud moment to be here today when uh, you know we having a Australia India actor. Uh, we are a migration services firm. Uh, we have an office here in Cochin. We support, uh, you know, skilled migration. And what we see from ACTA is, you know, there's a lot of export opportunities and it also brings the opportunity for people to do investor visas. So uh, if you look at the past, a lot of that happened from other countries, not from India. So this uh, kind of opportunity in business trade and business will bring a lot of opportunity for investor visas. So I've also got my co-founder, uh, Matthews David. He's a registered Mara agent. He's also from Kerala here with me. So if you need any details, you know, we are happy to share. And I live in uh, uh, Northern Territory in Darwin. Uh, Mr. Irfan mentioned earlier, had a connection with uh, in a long time ago with Kerala. So I wanted to say we are doing a global recruitment drive uh, and the Northern, uh, which is actually in partnership with Chamber of Commerce, Northern Territory, Minerals Council of Australia, Northern Territory and Master Builders ND. So we are sponsoring, you know, we are supporting the, the industry to sponsor 600 skilled workers from India and Philippines. And Northern Territory government specifically asked us to do a recruitment drive in Kochi. So we are doing that in Marriott Hotel uh, from 13th to 18th of February. And if you know the reason why the government asked us to do so, three years back, they did a, a survey in uh, migrants who live in the NT. And uh, Indians were one of the like top three population who lives, you know, who lives more than five years in the NT particularly Keralites. Uh, the, the reason is because it's tropical weather, you know, very similar that Darwin or Northern Territory is the closest to Asia, and you can get chaka, manga, tenga, anything you want there because it's 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 the safe climate, right? <laughs> so it's really a great place, and you know, being uh, being living in last seven years in ND, I always promote our place. Uh, that's all from our side, and all the best to everyone. Uh, you know, it's a great opportunity. Just make use of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sulaimata, Dr. Biju Kumar. Just briefly. The respected dignitaries on the dais. So June uh, is a multinational IT product development and services company uh, headquartered in Cochin in Info Park World Trade Center and having its global offices in US, UAE, and now we are expanding to Australia. So my uh, on behalf of June, my special appreciations to uh, Fiki, Director General of uh, Foreign Trade, and of course, the Australia India Business Council for taking this initiative and taking the trade valuation from 27 billion US dollars to 50 billion US dollars and to create 10 lakhs jobs in five years. So, June is contributing according to our vision and passion in developing technology expertise across the globe. We already have presence in multiple locations and we have more than 50 clients across the globe. And our expertise is wherever the innovative and challenging technology solutions is there, June has all the expertise to provide. So as part of this uh, bilateral agreement, June has already started its office in Australia. And in the first phase, we'll be contributing in uh, new and ener new renewable energy sector, cybersecurity and tourism. And of course, in the second phase, we'll be contributing to uh, other sectors like uh, in EdTech, we'll be contributing then, uh, of course, in entertainment, media and entertainment, and in cutting edge technologies like blockchain, metaverse, artificial intelligence and augmented reality. And we are expecting uh, to, to increase the trade value for, from our part to 100 million US dollars within a couple of years and to create 500 jobs, uh, especially in Kerala. So uh, we, we are also marking our presence and contribution towards the GDP. Thank you. So that completes the industry perspective. Now we have a very important session. Uh, Mr. Bibin Menon, Development Commission, now does just Department of Commerce, Government of India, and additional Director General Foreign Trade. So has been very kind, uh, very generous to us whenever we call him for any of our programs. And in fact, for the CPI events, sir, had come all the way from Delhi for the CPI event, and we traveled to Cochin, Trivandrum, and Calicut also. The first time we are doing this event on the Australia India Free Trade Agreement. Over to you, sir, for the presentations. Uh, all the distinguished dignitaries on the stage, 
uh, my uh, friends from the trade and industry, Fiki, and uh, all the other organizers in this uh, particular program. Uh, thanks for taking your valuable time out for this particular program. Uh, I just wanted to give you a perspective. It's a bit of a technical uh, session because it's primarily tailored to exporters from Kerala who want to export to Australia. Uh, sorry for the, uh, uh, I think the difference in the date there, but I think it's been corrected now. I just wanted to lay four, uh, four important points before I just start off on my presentation. Uh, first is, I think uh, you have to understand the strategic importance of the Indo-Pacific. Suddenly with the changes in the geostrategic, uh, uh, I mean, environment of the, of the globe, Indo-Pacific has become a very important area of, I would say, a lot of uh, uh, strategic moves that are being made by different countries. I think it's in, it's in that context that the India-Australia relationship is very, very critical. And that's why there's political backing on both sides. And uh, we need to understand that this is a very important region for us to really develop. Secondly, about the credibility of supply chains. I think this is very, very important. Today in the dynamics where you are depending on a few countries, I think even Australia is dependent on a few countries for their sourcing. Similarly, India is also dependent on a few sources. We have to look at credible suppliers from each other. And even in the G20, India is going to move a paper where we are looking at uh, such having such resilient supply chains. And that's where Australia becomes such an important partner. It is a very, very credible partner as far as India is concerned. And that's the reason that we need to really uh, leverage this particular partnership. Thirdly, uh, I think there was a talk by um, Mr. Rajamuni about the fact that our domestic industry should not be affected. That's a pretty important point because there are a lot of MSMEs in both Australia and India. So what we look at uh, in terms of this trade agreement is to look at replacing the existing suppliers in both countries rather than trying to impinge on the domestic manufacturing in both countries, what we call as trade diversion rather than trade creation. So let's let our exporters try to replace some of the major suppliers to Australia and let Australia try to replace some of the major suppliers to India. And that way, I think you're not going to really uh, affect the domestic manufacturers in both the countries. And that's, I think, a very important aspect. Another point I just wanted to indicate was that I think there was references to Northern Territory as well as uh, some of the other states that uh, uh, the Honorable uh, MP uh, alluded to. I think that's a very significant aspect. There are two, two states that, has, that have really been left out. One is the Northern Territory, which is, of course, very close to ASEAN and has a lot of similarities with some of the geographical uh, I mean, areas there. Secondly, you have Western Australia, which is the size of India virtually. I mean, a province which is the size of India, which has a lot of mineral resources. Of course, there's only one major city of Perth there, but still it's, a, it's an area that has a lot of potential. So I think you should also broaden your horizon to look at both these two provinces too, when you're looking at investments in Australia. I think that's a very critical aspect here. So I'll just go through my presentation fast. It's a bit of a technical thing, so I'll be as uh, fast as possible on that. And uh, uh, I'll just start off with the bilateral trade. We have a trade deficit, frankly, but that's because we are importing a lot of raw materials and intermediates from Australia. And that's actually a good thing into our supply chain. Uh, I'm not saying we're going to, we're going to correct that, but in, in a way where we have to look at seeing how much of these raw materials we can source for our own domestic industry and how much uh, we could really uh, work on this particular aspect. If you look at the top export categories from India, it's largely, I think you have petroleum products, you have pharmaceuticals, but this is India. This is not Kerala specifically. And uh, I think uh, we need to understand that Kerala, of course, has a different uh, economic status vis-a-vis -vis the whole country. But just to give you a flavor in terms of what are the exports going to uh, Australia and how we could really uh, leverage these. Uh, I, I had this slide because I just wanted to indicate to you that Australia's top, the top five or six supplies in Australia are China, the US, Japan, Germany, Thailand. If you look at all the product categories, it's right from uh, chapter one round to chapter 90, uh, 19 engineering. I think the objective should be for us to really increase our shares in these uh, on these products. And that will be a win-win situation for both the countries because I think that's the way we need to approach. Similarly, Australia should also uh, approach this agreement in the same way in terms of trying to replace the existing uh, suppliers of uh, to India. And uh, I think we need we really need to work on all these products. But this is just to give you a rough idea in terms of the top ten countries uh, to Australia. Uh, this is a bit technical. Uh, rules of origin, I think, is a very critical aspect since most of you are exporting. You will be taking a certificate of origin from some of the agencies. DGFT is one of the agencies that can issue for all the products. Uh, the EIC can issue also for all the products. 
but uh, please uh, have a compliance team. I think all, all the exporters who are there at least have a compliance team which goes through these agreements, which has a, a modicum of an idea in terms of what your ex entire process is and how you should look at getting your uh, specific origin criteria met. I'm not going to go in, into detail in all this, uh, but just wanted to give you the one flavor on, on value addition. There, is, there are two value additions here. One is a 35% value addition. One is a 45% value addition, depending on the formula that you actually choose. So let me just come to this criteria of wholly obtained. This is the first criteria that all of you have to look at. But please, I would desist, especially the non-agricultural exporters, the people who are in industrial goods, please do not use the wholly obtained criteria. Because wholly obtained primarily means that uh, for example, to give you a very small example, somebody asked me about leather. If I'm exporting a leather bag, can it be wholly obtained because everything comes from India? You have to go down to the minutest part that the buffalo has to be born and raised in India. And from there, the, uh, the height comes. So unless you are able to retrace your entire supply chain down to the last person, for example, spices and all may be okay because everything comes from Kerala probably. We're not importing anything excepting probably some other uh, preservatives or something that you might add to that. But apart from agriculture, I would desist anybody to use wholly obtained because there's always a possibility, there's an iota of possibility that there are some non-originating inputs that are being taken from outside. Uh, we also had a training of our DGFT officers just two days back on this. Uh, so please use the product specific rule, which is the rule that ensures that the good is originating in Kerala and India, basically. So this is just a I mean, rough idea which I wanted to give you, but in case you have a non-originating good and some waste and scrap is generated in India, that waste and scrap can be wholly obtained. And if you're making something out of that, it could be a wholly obtained. But otherwise, please on industrial goods, try to refrain from that. Uh, and this is the primary purpose of giving this particular slide to, to you. Now, many of you would encounter this concept of a change in tariffs uh, classification uh, just to make you understand what it means if you have non-originating inputs i think all of you have to be uh, i mean are familiar with the harmonized system codes so if you have a non-originating input that non-originating input has to be transformed at at the six digit level four digit level or the or the two digit level to your product for example if i'm taking uh in australia i think the last one is more important the ctsh which is the change at the six digit level so if you have, you're exporting, say, uh, I'll take the example of cashew, for example, because Kerala is, I think, I think that's more relevant. If you have raw cashew, uh, which is 080131, uh, you're importing that, and you finally make uh, d shell cashew, which is 080132, that's a change in tariff subheading. So you are, you are allowed to import raw cashew to make the uh, d shell cashew, and that's the where you can, and then you can export that provided you have the value addition. So CTSH is one of the important criteria you should understand. And you should have a cost materials sheet which gives you what are the inputs and whether this transformation has happened in that particular case or not, depending on your industry. Uh, another six digit which I can talk about is, for example, if you have ceiling fans, the parts of ceiling fans are in a different six digit. So you can import the part of ceiling fans to make ceiling fans and then export to Australia and then have a CTSH happening there. So the cost sheet is very critical to understand as to what are the inputs and how is it, it's being transformed into a final product. Uh, please stop me at this point if you have any questions, because this is a bit technical, but I think most of you exporters are into this business, so you, you, you may be understanding that if there is a particular uh, I mean, issue you have here. Now the value addition, there are two types of value additions here. One is a build up and one is a build down. In the build up formula, you need to have a 35% value addition. And in the build down, you need to have a 45% value addition. Why two different value additions? Because in the first example on top, you, you don't have profits. But in the second uh, method of calculation, profit is inherent because you have the FOB value. The FOB value comes through your shipping bill and the value of originating and non-originating materials have to be also calculated uh, specifically. So how do you calculate value of originating material, which is the first formula of 
you have to look if you have non originating materials then the production of that on that non originating materials in india or some originating materials which have been added on to that would also be part of your value of originating material if it's self produced if you have the entire value chain within yourself then whatever you have you have as originating materials and the process is going into that as also part of a value of originating material you can include the cost of insurance freight packing for transportation to the producer this is a flexibility that you all get to reach this 35% value addition and please be very careful when you calculate this value addition you have to have very clear cut indications in what this value of non originating material is what is the production that's happened inside your this thing factory how much is the value addition that you're creating out of that and then add it up and if it's 35% you are through so i think this is a critical one and if you if it's the second formula which is the 45% value addition which is which which i told you was the build down formula then you have to have the bill of entry where you have the cif value of imported materials and you could deduct the freight and insurance from the port kerala for example the kochi port to some interior part of kerala where you are you have your factory so that's a, a deduction that you could actually make uh, and that deduction helps you to reach the 45% which is uh, which is also one of the criteria there now other important aspects you might have a warehouse in an asean country because asean country will, would be the country between india and australia you might have a warehouse in singapore indonesia thailand anywhere you could use this model and the goods could transit through those particular areas provided it's only for unloading reloading storing repacking and relabeling so you can store your goods in those warehouses because i think uh, for, firstly for most of your businesses just just supplying to australia may not make uh, economic sense in terms of economies of scale you might have a warehouse and suddenly there's an order that comes from australia after two months you might you might want to ship ship, ship it there but your major this thing market may be the asean maybe china maybe japan maybe korea so you'd like to make a warehouse in asean and then try to uh, export to all these markets so you can do that provided you don't do any specific processing in that warehouse market you you only do splitting consolidation of loads and it has to be under the customs control of singapore thailand uh, indonesia whichever country you have the warehouse in you need to maintain five years records i think this is a very critical aspect that's why i would again emphasize to you this is a tariff preference that you're getting so please get your compliance teams to have this record for 5 years because tomorrow if you don't have this record there could be issues with some in terms of verifications uh and uh, you can also claim for preferences uh, post importation uh, for 12 months so that's uh, that's the other aspect uh i'll not go too much into this uh, again i think transit up covered minimal operations i don't think this is very critical but if anybody has any questions i think we can uh, take it up later normally the certificate of origin is issued from either before the export happens or within 5 days of the export so that's the normal certificate of origin but i told you about the warehousing model if you have a warehouse and you are taking it out uh, off say you already exported it to singapore stored it in a warehouse there and then you're taking it out into australia uh, it might take it might be 2 2 or 3 months in that case you can issue a retrospective certificate of origin retrospective certificate of origin can be issued up to 12 months from the date of your shipment that is precisely to take care of these models where you have a transit country where you have a warehouse or the goods are in transit on a ship for example and Suddenly, an order comes from Australia that uh, that I need to ship that, and obviously you don't have the certificate of origin because it's already uh, it's already on the ship. Then you can use the prospective, uh, the retrospective certificate of origin. And if the exporter has made a genuine error in the certificate and he wants to get a new one issued, then of course also a retrospective uh, might come into account. But again, it's in the hands of the issuing agency. if they feel that the reason is valid for the issuance of retrospective certificate of origin then they can issue that so again you need to apply for the certificate of origin all the exporters there is a common digital platform of the dgft office uh, just uh, just go through that you already may have a username and password if you if not please register yourself uh, you just need the ic number for that and you can get yourself registered and then you can just have a 
look through the system in terms of how you apply. You need to have the commercial invoice with you. You need to have the cost sheet as per a format given. The format is given in the platform itself. These two documents are absolutely critical in an application for the certificate of origin. And the format would be as per a minimum information requirement. That's how it's issued. It'll, it'll be for a single importation. There could be multiple invoices and goods. The certificate of origin is valid for 12 months and non-party invoicing is allowed. So that means there could be a third party which invoices it. It could be invoiced in Singapore or some other country. And that's, uh, that's permissible under this particular agreement. So this is the format. I don't know whether it's very legible, but this is the minimum information requirement, the format of the certificate of origin. And this is the cost sheet. This is also available on the platform. So you need to fill up this cost sheet. The cost sheet basically talks about the export product. Everything is based on harmonized system. So I think all of you should be well versed in that. At least your compliance team should be well versed in that. And you should know what the imported inputs are and what is your export product, what is the HS code of that. And this cost sheet has to be also filled up. So these two documents are essential when you're applying for the certificate of origin. The other digital things that you need to look at is uh, you need to have a digital signature certificate, which is class three and the IEC embedded in that. I think all of you would be having it as, as exporters because you apply for many schemes of the DGFT. Uh, if there is some technical issues coming in, maybe the Java system is not in, installed in your, uh, Java is not installed in your system. So please go through that, configure Java and add it into the uh, particular uh, page of yours. Invoice is a mandatory document, cash, cash cost sheet is as per the format and the document size that whatever you're uploading, the invoice or the cost sheet, uh, it should be less than 2 MB. That's, well, that's one of the things. I think it's in PDF that you can offer, I mean, upload that. So have a feel of this. This is the digital platform. This is a website. Uh, this is the opening page of that. You have to register as an exporter. Uh, you'll come into this particular format here. And then I've just given certain examples in terms of what, uh, I mean, how you can fill. If it's a retrospective certificate of origin, you can just write the reason. Because what initially happened was that the agreement came, came into force on 29th of December, but some exports had already occurred to Australia before that. And suddenly uh, people wanted to get the certificate of origin of Australia. So that's also a case where retrospective can be issued. Uh, so this is an example again of how to fill that up. So I'm, I've, I've, just, I've just given a few slides here, but please go through that. Uh, this is a case of gems and jewelry, which I'd given in terms of, suppose you have a studded jewelry that you're exporting, uh, started with diamonds. So the gold may be imported from say UAE, the, uh, the diamonds may be imported from South Africa. So how do you exactly fill this up? And, uh, uh, in, in terms of a specific, this thing is, is what uh, I've, I've been trying to um, put here. Now, before I end, uh, I'll start off with Kerala's specific exports to Australia. But uh, before that, I wanted, is there any specific questions that you have or, or we can take the questions later? Because this is a technical thing. I think please get all your compliance teams to be very conversant with the system because they would have to apply, it, apply on this and then only uh, get the certificate of origin after which you can get the tariff preferences. So Kerala exports uh, largely plantation products, which is basically tea, coffee, spices, all that. Carpets, as, as Hari mentioned, chapter 57. So there are other costs, uh, chapter 33, I think they are uh, ex ex exporting a lot of uh, uh, oils, essential oils. Then, so you have a number of products that Kerala, uh, Kerala is exporting to Australia. And, uh, Again, we have to look at whether there are specific preferences available. Unfortunately, there is no tariff preference available on marine products. So that's why I have not covered that. It's already at zero in Australia, chapter three and chapter 16. So marine products are not there, but, but there are some certain other products which uh, you can specifically look at. Now, let me give you a flavor on what these values are. The first value is uh, it's... Kerala's total exports, KERX. The second one is Kerala's exports to Australia. These are all in rupees crore. Third is India's exports to Australia, again in rupees crore. The fourth is Australia's global imports. This is in dollar million. You can just multiply it by eight, so you'll get rupees crore there. So just to take the first example, uh, 
uh, other vegetable frozen. So these these are frozen vegetables which Kerala is currently exporting. They are exporting around uh, 19 crores to uh, globally. To Australia, they are exporting around three crores, and India is exporting around uh, 21 crores of it. And Australia's global imports is around uh, 240 crores. So there's a huge potential. I mean, you're just exporting three crores to Australia right now. And uh, the duty is 5%. It's, uh, you, it's got to be made zero. And the rules of origin is wholly obtained, which means that the entire vegetable has to be grown in Kerala or, or in India. And it has to be subsequently frozen. Uh, so that's very critical. I mean, you have to ensure that, that you have the value chain, which clearly says that the entire vegetable is grown in uh, India and it's frozen here, then it becomes a WO. Secondly, uh, the second example is of onions dried. So that's also the same. I think you, you have all the values there. Uh, Australia has global imports of around, uh, into eight is around 88 crores, uh, while Kerala is only exporting around 0.3 crores to Australia, while Kerala globally exports around 2.3 2 crores. So these are existing markets that you should tap in. Uh, the Honorable MP mentioned about the fact that uh, we have to look at potential products also, which are, which are not being exported. But I think the first basket is to look at the existing products which are going to Australia, because that's the low-hanging fruit that you can really work on. Subsequently, you can look at products where there is potential, where Kerala is actually exporting a lot, but not exporting to Australia at all. So that could be the next basket which you look at. But first of all, get your existing basket in order and get at least the preferences on that. Uh, then you have, uh, if I take the big uh, big ticket items here, you have other vegetable extracts, 1302, 1990, uh, which Kerala is significantly exporting around 173 crores, but only around 4.6 crores to Australia. Uh, and uh, therefore, I think it's important to look at how uh, th there is a mismatch in certain data because of the fact that uh, the data sources are... Uh, also taken differently, but Australia's global imports is around 490 or 500 crores. So that's a potential that you should really look at. So you have uh, mixes and doughs. I think that was a product which Hari also mentioned. Uh, that's also, I think, uh, has a lot of potential. CC means any non-originating input can be taken from outside. So you can import some vegetables and then make an extract out of that. Then we come to uh, processed foods, pastries and cakes, for example. Again, uh, if I look at all these figures, it's uh, giving you the same uh, issue that, uh, for example, if I look at pastries and cakes, uh, Kerala is exporting around 10 crores uh, globally. And uh, India's exports to Australia is around 1.1, while Kerala's exports to Australia is around 0.8. So there's, there's a small margin, but then... Australia's global imports is around 4,000 crores. So that's a major this thing. Why are we not in this market is something we have to look at. And there's a 5% duty that comes down to zero. A CTSH plus 35, 45% means that technically in pastries and cakes, you can import, uh, you, could, you, you could import milk, you could import sugar, you could import flour. Provided you meet the 35 and 45 percent value addition criteria, because the CTSH would happen automatically there. So then you have things like uh, papad, for example, that's being exported from Kerala. So I'm I've gone as per the HS code. So that's why starting we have all the agricultural products. Uh, then we come into uh, then we come into the next slide, which is again about. Uh, other conveyor, so, so we have certain rubber products, 4010, 4011, we have pneumatic tires, we have floor coverings, we have other, uh, plywood, for example, trays, dishes, plates of paper or paperboard. So I think all of this, I think there's huge potential in Kerala. I'll, I'll leave this slide here. All of you, please go through this. If you're, if you're manufacturing this, uh, Kerala is manufacturing this, but, but, I, but I don't know whether you people are uh, in this particular industry. Have a look on this and uh, see that there's huge potential in terms of how you could increase your exports on this. Carpets, for example. Then we have dadis. We have blended, uh, uh, again, carpets. And then there's babies, garments, napkins, uh, handloom tablecloth, terry towel, 
and other than handloom cushion covers all these are important products that kerala is exporting to australia you have flexible intermediate bulk containers man made articles of cotton other made up articles high aluminia uh, high alumin uh, alumina bricks and uh, shapes tableware other articles of uh, aluminium parts of machinery orthopedic or fracture appliances flow meters toys for example the last one is toys so all these are huge potential exports of from kerala to uh, australia and i think uh, the industry here should really look at focusing on these products now i picked up the imports from uh, australia into kochi air and sea so the kochi air and sea whatever imports happen from australia the big ticket items uh, start from oranges so there is oranges mandarins there is a trq or tariff rate quota of 137000 tons here so if you want to import these things from australia this this is what's happening currently in kochi but uh, there's potential to actually look at some imports dried pasta zirconium concentrates lng all those are inputs for your industry other manganese oxides other salts other vitamins and their derivatives other medicaments so 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 this medical this thing organic self active agents that's also part of this and then we come into uh, lightweight coated paper aseptic uh, packaging paper paper and paper boards cotton other than uh, other than indian of all staple links then you have parts of anchor then you come into steel products parts of anchors and grapnels then you have other automatic circuit breakers other electrodes lasers other than laser diodes and parts and accessories of instruments and gas or smoke analyzer so these are imports that could happen from australia and i think these are important things that uh, you could look at in importing as uh, inputs for industry so i think i'll stop at that and uh, i know it's a bit technical but it's important that you at least unless you got to know this information it will be difficult for you to utilize the agreement itself and uh, you should be very clear in terms of how you apply because if you make mistakes is obviously an issue about uh, what will happen in terms of the verification mechanisms so i think this is a great agreement uh, i was i mean uh, we in noida is it also i think flagged off one of our consignments on 29th of uh, and interestingly that consignment was of bath tubs uh, it yeah it will be pretty interesting to note that there's there's one unit in our zone that exports the entire bath tubs of plastics that go to australia and these guys are uh, now started to increase the exports there so gems and jewelry we do a lot of gems and jewelry uh, those guys are excited almost as as excited as the india ue agreement so i think please uh, as, as as hari mentioned one important thing is that we have to do these outreaches get people to understand this agreement and so that they apply for that and uh, just to uh, sign off on a different note uh, i'm also associated with the with one track of the india uk negotiations uh as 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 was mentioned earlier this was probably the first uh, trade agreement with a developed country on a full scale of course we had an agreement with japan uh, which was done much earlier in 2011 uh so but the, the japan dynamics were a bit different from what we did with australia so india is getting in, getting into this foray of trying to negotiate with some developed countries canada eu uk it's a it's a learning experience for us because of course the templates are very different in certain cases but uh, let's hope uh, we do uh, some uh, we make progress on this uh, both uk and canada there is possibility of things happening fast but again negotiations are going to be very very uh, difficult and as far as the uh, sepa uh, this thing with australia goes i think that's also going to be one of the key issues as we take it up so thanks to all of you and uh, take care thank you mr bibin menon development commissioner noida ss and department of commerce government of india and additional director of foreign trade for the highly informative technical session and detailed analysis on the trade agreement of course bibin menon will be available later on also to have the doubts or clarified since we have exceeded the time limit we'll ask take few questions then 
uh, we will wind up. So few questions we'll take. Also, Judy and uh, Irfan Malik will be also available here to have a one-to-one -one meeting also. So now the floor is open. Uh, please, uh, you can have a few questions raised. Please introduce yourself and also please uh, clarify to, to which speaker you would like to address this uh, question. Uh, good evening. Uh, myself, Shamir, uh, actually from furniture industry. I saw one of the slides have the seventh one was furniture uh, for the free trade agreement. But uh, when I was uh, checking on the list, I couldn't find furniture in the list exporting or importing. I would like to know is already on a free trade agreement for zero uh, duty. Yeah, just give me a minute because I think chapter 23 is chapter 94. Uh, I, I'm also surprised as why it's not there in the list of products, but just give me a time. I'll, I'll just give you a. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. To save the time, we can have the next question yeah, yeah, by the sure, time. Sure. It will be clear. Yeah. Gio. Uh, well, I think when I look at furniture, there is a 5% duty, but probably there's no exports happening from Kerala. That's the reason I have not. Uh, so this is the first basket, as I mentioned, whatever is being exported from by, from Kerala to Australia, I've just taken that basket. So maybe it's not being exported right now, but but there's a 5% duty there, which is immediately eliminated. So if, and if you are in furniture, please uh, explore that. Hmm. But that's, yeah. So Hari is saying that plywood is exported, but that's on a different thing. That's just the raw this thing, plywood. Yeah, uh, good evening. Um, I'm um, uh, dignitaries on your guys. Uh, my name is Deva Prashant. I'm the chairman and MD of uh, URI Genome. We are into uh, genomics, preventive genomics, DNA research, where we identify the uh, predisposition for various diseases well in advance, and we help them in preventing or eliminating or like you no know, uh, reducing the pack so would like to know whether it will be like uh, i was going through the list and a lot of uh, products like uh, pharmaceutical and medical allied industries are present in that one whether there will be any scope for us like the people who are into genetics and all those things to explore market in australia so uh, whether it will be like a kind of an export thing or will it be like in a kind of a, a agreement or tying up with some companies existing companies with their available there. I'd like to know more about that as well. So yeah, definitely uh, healthcare uh, research and innovation is a sector of uh, definitely significance here. There's a uh, heightened, uh, uh, I mean, there's definitely focus given there. Uh, obviously it's a service sector. So this uh, ECTA agreement is not covered services. So digital, some, some part of the services, but yeah. But definitely this healthcare, the, the area that you've touched on is of a importance a bit bilaterally as well. And Australia is a great market in that genome mix as well. Yeah, so definitely there are partners to look at there. I'll, I'll let someone else add. Yeah, just to say that um, if you have a healthcare product in Australia to do check also what uh, local regulations might apply. So our healthcare sector is quite stringently regulated, kind of in addition to anything that's about the service export. But um, would you be delivering the service here in India or in Australia? Uh, actually, we are uh, collecting samples across the world because oh. we are using the uh, like the machines imported from USA and the, uh, the Canadian kit, which is a Canadian manufactured kit has been used for collecting the uh, samples as well. It's a buccal cavity, not the blood samples. It's a saliva buccal cavity sample, which has been collected for DNA research. And we cover almost 100 diseases well in advance. 
so that they can have a uh, knowledge about like you know, high risk medium risk or uh, normal risk for any kind of including cancer almost 15 types of cancer as well so that can so be yeah, think, uh, Ms. Jody was talking before about the importance of researching the Australian market, looking for kind of comparable companies that might be operating there, but do also check the regulations that might apply in Australia for that. Thank you. Hello, I am Rajesh. I am the head QA QC of Vaidaratna Vrshala. I just want to ask that whether uh, this agreement has uh, made uh, any additions or any leverages uh, in the scenario of uh, export of herbal as a drug character and herbal as a food character. Uh, when I'm looking at chapter 30, which is, I think, probably the products that you're exporting, it's already at zero duty in Australia. So you won't have any specific benefits uh, as such in terms of the tariff there. So if the tariff is already zero, there is no this thing at all. Uh, I, I just missed out one point. I mean, slightly unrelated to this, which I forgot in my presentation. Uh, in the services sector, you have these students who have been given this extension of uh, stay there. I mean, the the diploma holders for 18 months, the graduates for two years, some of the people in STEM probably also for two years, for the postgraduates. Uh, I would request some of you to tap into that, that source as, as probably your marketing uh, people there. Because again, some of you who are MSMEs may not be able to commit uh, your uh, people there in Australia to market your products there. So please try to use this talent that is available there. These guys could help you out. I don't know, I mean, how exactly, but since uh, they're already available there in Australia and, and they're going to stay there for two, two years and they have that uh, experience, please try to use them as a talent pool for your marketing in that country. So that could be at least cutting down your costs a bit and uh, at least making you more competitive. But on this particular thing, there's nothing. There is an annex on pharmaceuticals, but if you ask me very frankly, it's English. It's not anything very substantive in terms of commitments there. But yes, I mean, in the future, when the SEPA comes, probably we'll, uh, we'll look at some sort of uh, uh, specific commitments on the pharmaceuticals annex, which is because NTPs are a very important part in the pharmaceuticals, despite the fact that the tariffs are zero in Australia. So we do hope on the SEPA, when the SEPA is being negotiated, we'll have a bit more of uh, meat in the text on pharmaceuticals. And can I just add on that, because I don't think very many of us spoke actually about the fact that this is um, this is a compliant free trade agreement, but we also wish to do another subsequent agreement, the Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement, ASECA, uh, which will go further on some topics and cover topics that were not included in ECTA, including investment, government procurement, we hope, digital economy, we hope. So uh, we are continuing the conversations about how we can go even further to support bilateral trade and investment. Uh, actually, this gentleman ask, was asking not about a trade or a tariff reduction. Uh, the issue with particular to Ayurveda sector is that he, this is a very prominent sector in, uh, in our state. And uh, when he wants to export the Ayurveda medicinal products to countries like Australia, he is facing a large number of compliance and regulatory related issues. For example, this registration of this product in that country and uh, so many uh, related uh, things which are uh, which he is facing and uh, site as related issues uh, these are all the issues which uh, he was asking ki whether if suppose a drug an ayurveda drug is widely used in india whether the same drug can be exported to australia without further uh, further registration or licensing that is what he's asking he is asking for so uh, he, you would like yeah, I've kind of uh, probably I've spoken to the gentleman as well, uh, and I've been experienced in that sector even recently hosting certain Ayurvedic uh, product companies. Uh, the TGA guidelines are stringent, so definitely, and, and specifically Ayurveda, including some ma major manufacturer from Australia, so from uh, Kerala, have uh, come. Uh, I mean, TGA has come hard on them because of the iron content. So, what is the TGA uh, conformance is definitely required. But what uh, this ECTA enables is if you've got uh, approvals, FDA or 
other European Union approvals, it allows for fast tracking of uh, you know TGA certification, but definitely conformance to Australian uh, you know TGA guidelines, therapeutical guidelines are still significant. But I'm hopeful that uh, you know we could facilitate and see how uh, we can get more support. What I've also heard is uh, fr from broader group is sometimes engaging TGA uh, and getting response has been hard. So it's something which we'll take it up formally as well, and we are hopeful. We just were with the Farm Excel delegation. Uh, team uh, yeah, day before yesterday in Hyderabad. As we host them, uh, we will try and engage TGA to really acknowledge that there is a more possibility to see how we can streamline. They've uh, uh, even uh, for some of the drugs, uh, uh, they've even said it's up, up to 120 days approval process has also been uh, rec recognized. But where you have FDA or uh, other European Union, uh, you know, registration already. That's all I want to add. Thank you. I think we have already exceeded the time limit. Of course, you'll be having a lot of questions. We can have the questions clarified after the event also uh, with the uh, Bibin Mensur as well as uh, Judy Mackey will be also here. And uh, um, Irfan will be also here to have one-to-one -one discussions also. So uh, uh, before winding up the program, as a token of gratitude, I'd like to invite Mr. Alex Naina to hand over a, uh, our gratitude of a compliment to his, Her Excellency, Ms. Sarah. Australian Council as a part of a uh, compliment on the Fiki site. It's a gift from the land of spices, Kerala. I request uh, Mr. Al uh, Mr. K. M. Hadlal also, JDF duty, please hand over uh, a compliment to Ms. Jody Mackey. Once again, request to Ms. Alex Nanan to hand over uh, our compliment to Sri Bibin Manon. Alex, of course, please remain and to please hand over a uh, compliment to our own Mr. Irfan Malik. Thank you once again to all our distinguished uh, participants and invitees from the trade industry for being with us. And uh, we are really grateful for your, your presence. And also, of course, I already mentioned you can have the doubts and clarified and also one-to-one -one discussion also to keep place. I also like to thank our key dignities of the sessions. Uh, Her Excellency, Ms. Sarah, coming all the way up Chennai for this session. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us. And of course, Ms. Judy McCann, National Chair, Australian India Business Council, and they've been part of this uh, series in various parts of the city. And uh, as I said, they were Hyderabad in, in, in Kerala also today, and they are going to Chennai, but I learned this. Thank you, ma'am. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Alex Kene, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Irfan Malik, uh, also National uh, Associate Chair and President in NSTV for this session. And also our co partners, of course, Bivin Sir, I need to well, thank him, sir, he's been always with us. Uh, thank you, sir, for being with us also for this program. And also to thank uh, in this absence, Mr. Raju, uh, Mr. Vendor Rajamana, EFS, former ambassador, who presiding on the function. I'd like to thank uh, also our co partners on the, our own uh, uh, JDF team, Mr. Hedlal, sir, and also Alex Tianan. Thank you, each one of you. Kindly do join for the network, network and dinner also. Thank you. Of course, you can have the one to one discussion also with the officials also here. Yeah, yes, sir. I also forgot to acknowledge the supporting partners. Uh, in fact, without their support, this program would not be possible. I'd like to thank uh, our all supporting partners, uh, Mr. Tussex uh, and IT, June IT Solutions Private Limited and ACT Migration Services for the support for this uh, organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you.